A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammil Qum Al-Layla Illa Qalila Nisfahu Aw Inqus Minhu Qalila Aw Zid Alayhi Wa Rattil Al-Quran Tartila Inna Sanulqi Alayka Qawlan Thaqila إن ناشية الليل هي أشد وطأ وأقوى مقيلا إن لك في النهار سبحا طويلا واذكر اسم ربك وتبتل إليه تبديلا رب المشرق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو فاتخذه وكيلا واصبر على ما يقولون واهجرهم هجرا جميلا وذرني والمكذبين أولي النعمة ومهلهم قليلا إن الذين أنكالا وجحيما وتعاما دا خسة وعذابا أليما يوم ترجف الأرض والجبال وكانت الجبال كثيبا مهيلا إنا أرسلنا إليكم رسولا شاهدا عليكم كما أرسلنا إلى فرعون رسولا فعصى فرعون الرسول فأخذناه أخذا وبيلا فكيف تتقون إن كفرتم يوم يجعل الولدان شيبا السماء منفطر به كان وعده مفعولا إن هذه تذكرة فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا إن ربك يعلم أنك تقوم أدنى من ثلثي الليل ونصفه وثلثه وطائفة من الذين معك والله يقدل الليل والنهار علم أن لن تحسوه فتاب عليكم فاقرؤوا ما تيسر من القرآن علم أن سيكون منكم مرضى وآخرون يضربون في الأرض يبتغون من فضل الله وآخرون يقاتلون في سبيله فقرأوا ما تيسر منه وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأقرض الله قرضا حسنا وما تقدموا لأنفسكم من وما تقدموا لأنفسكم من خير تجدوه عند الله هو خير وعظم أجرا واستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ياسين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم تنزل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد أكل كولا لا أكثر فهم لا يؤمنون إنا جعلنا في أناق مغلالا فيل الأطفال فهم مكمهون وجعلنا من بين يديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأكشيناهم فهم لا يبصرون فالسواء عليهم وأنذرتهم أم لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون إنما تنذر من اتبع الذكر وخشي الرحمن بالغيب فبشروا بمغفرة واجر كريم إنا نحن نهي الموتى ونكتب ما قدموا أثارهم وكل شيء أحصيناه في إمام مبين واضرب لهم مثلا أصحاب الكريح إذ جاء المرسلون إذ أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبوهما فعززنا بثالث فقالوا إنا إليكم مرسلون قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء أنتم إلا تكذبون قالوا ربنا يعلم إنا إليكم لمرسلون وما علينا إلا البلاء المبين قالوا إنا تطيرنا بكم لئن لم تنتهوا لنجمنكم ولا مسنكم منا عذاب عليم قالوا طائركم معكم إن ذكرتم بل أنتم قوم مسرفون وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجرا وهم مهتدون وما لي لا عبد الذي فطرني وإليه ترجعون أتخذ من دوني آلية إن يردني الرحمن بذر لا تغني أني شفاعتم شيئا ولا ينكذون إني ظل في ظلال مبين إني آمنت بربكم فاسمعون كيل أدخل الجنة قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون بما غفر لي ربي وجعلني من المكرمين وما أنزلنا لا قومي من بعد من جند من السماء وما كنا منزلين إن كانت إلا صيحة واحدة فإذا هم خامدون يا حسرة على العباد ما يأتيه من رسول إلا كانوا به يستحزون ألم يروا كم أهلكنا قبله من الكرون أنهم إليهم لا يرجعون وإن كل لما جميع لدينا محذرون وآتوا لهم العرض الميتة وأحييناها وأخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من نخيل وعناب وفجرنا فيها من الأيون ليأكلوا من ثمره وما عملت ويديهم فلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت العرض ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلمون وعات لهم الليل نسلخ من النهار فإذا مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تكثير العزيز العليم والكمر قدرنا منازل التعادة كالرجون القديم للشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك الكمر ولا الليل السابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون وعاط لو أننا حملنا ذرية في الفلك المشؤون وخلقنا لهم من مثل ما يركبون وإن نشأ نغركم فلا سريخ لهم ولا هم ينكذون إلا رحمة من لا متاع لا حين وإذا كيل لهم اتكوا ما بين أيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تأتي من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا أنها مورضين 
وإذا كيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا ونتموا من لو يشاء والله أتعمى إن أنتم إلا في ظلال مبين ويقولون متى عاد الوعد إن كنتم صادقين ما ينظرون إلا سيعة واحدة تأخذهم وهم يخصمون ولا يستطيعون توسية ولا إلى أحلم يرجعون ونفق في السور فإذا هم من الأداس إلى ربهم ينسلون قالوا يا ويلنا من بعثنا من مركدنا هذا ما وعد الرحمن وصدق المرسلون إن كانت إلا سيعة واحدة فإذا هم جميع لدينا محذرون فاليوم لا تظلم نفس شيء ولا تزون إلا ما كنتم تعملون إن أصحاب الجنة اليوم في شغل فاكهون هم وزواج في ظلال على الأرائك متكئون لهم فيها فاكهة ولهم ما يدعون سلام كولا من رب الرحيم ممتاز اليوم أيها المجرمون لما أحد إليكم يا بني آدم لا تعبد الشيطان إنه لكم أذو مبين وعني بذوني هذا صراط مستقيم ولقد أظل منكم جبلا كثيرا فلم تكونوا تأكلون هذه جهنم التي كنتم توعدون إسلوا اليوم بما كنتم تكفرون اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا عيديهم وتشهد أرجل بما كانوا يكسبون ولو نشاء لتمسنا على أعينهم فاستمكوا السراط فعنا يبصرون ولو نشاء لما سخنا ولا مكانة فما استطاع مضيا ولا يرجعون ومن نعمره منكس في الخالق فلا يعكلون وما علمنا الشعر وما ينبغي لا إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين لينذر من كان حيا ويحق الكول على الكافرين أولم يروا أننا خلقنا لهم مما من تيدينا نعما فهم لها مالكون وذللنا لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع مشارب فلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله يالية لا لم ينسرون لا يستطيعون نسمهم لهم جند محذرون فلا يحزنك كول منا نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون أولم ير الإنسان وأنا خلقنا من نطفة فإذا هو خسيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلق قال من يهي الإضام وهي رميم كل يهي الذي أنشاء ولا مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخذل نارا فإذا أنتم منه توكدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادنا على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الله صل على محمد رحم الله من كرع سورة مباركة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما
الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أشهد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن علي ولي الله أشهد أن علي حجة الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل حي على خير العمل قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر
لا إله إلا الله صلاة المغرب إن الصلاة والنسق ومحيا يا ومماتي لله رب العالمين وجهت وجه الذي فطر السماوات حميد فمسك الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصابر الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد كذلك الله ربي الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكن عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر الحمد لله وخير الأسماء لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد سبحان الله وبحمده لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمد ربي صل على محمد وآل محمد سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمد ربي صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمد ربي صل على محمد وآل محمد يا لطيف ارحم ابدك الضعيف الله أكبر الحمد لله 
وخير الأسماء لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم عني سلوك موجبات رحمتك وزائم مغفرتك والنجاة من النار ومن قلب الياح والفوز بالجنة ورضوان في دار السلام وجوار نبيك محمد عليه وآله السلام اللهم ما بنا من نعمة فمنك لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك
اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله اكبر الله اكبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله صلى على محمد اشهد ان عليا ولي الله اشهد ان عليا حجه الله حي على الصلاه حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل حي على خير العمل قد قامت الصلاه قد قامت الصلاه الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا الله صلاة العشاء إن الصلاة ونسقي وما حيايا وما ماتي لله رب العالمين إني وجهت وجه الذي فطر السماوات والأرض حنيف مسجد الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد كذلك الله ربي الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكن عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر الحمد لله وخير الأسماء لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر 
Subhanallahi, Subhanallahi, Subhanallah, Subhana Rabbi, ala ala wa bihamdih. Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh, Allahu Akbar. Subhanallahi, Subhanallahi, Subhanallah, Subhana Rabbi, ala ala wa bihamdih. Allahu Akbar, bihawlillahi wa quwwatihi aqumu wa aqa'ad wa arqa wa asjud. Allahu Akbar Subhanallah 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 Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim Wa Bihamd Rabbi Salli Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Sami'a Allah Liman Hamida Allahu Akbar Subhanallah 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 Subhana Rabbi Al-Ala Wa Bihamd Rabbi Salli Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh, Allahu Akbar. Subhanallahi, subhanallahi, subhanallah, subhana Rabbi ala ala wa bihamdi Rabbi salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Ya latif, irham abdaka al-dhaif. Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah, wa khayru al-asma'i lillah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم عنا ليس لعلم بماضي رزقي وعنما أطلبه بخطرات تحضر على قلبي فعجول في تلبيه البودان فعنا فيما أنا طالب كالحيران لا أدري في سحر هو عم في جبل أم في عدن أم في سماء أم في بر أم في بحر ولا يدي من ومن قبل من وقد علمت أن علمه عندك وأسبابه بيدك وأنت الذي تقسمه بلطفك وتسببه برحمتك اللهم فصل على محمد وآله وجل يا رب رزقك لي واسعا ومطلبه سحلا وما خده قريبا ولا تعنني بطلب ما لم تقدر لي فيه رزقا فإنك غني عن أدابي وأنا فقير إلى رحمتك فصلي على محمد وآله وجد لعبتك بفضلك إنك ذو فضل عظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا بعد الله الحسين والذروة التي حلت في نارك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بكيت وبك ليل والنهار ولا جعله الله أحرحت مني زيارتكم السلام على الحسين ولا علي بن الحسين ولا أولاد الحسين ولا أصحاب الحسين ولا تسد المعصوم من دوريتك علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر ولي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي ولي بن محمد رسل بن علي والهجرة بن الحسن أجل الله فرجه تخل الله مخرجه وظهوره والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة بن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وهافدا وقاودا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك التوى وتمتع فيها طويلا برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيم ما محمد وآل محمد صلوات لا شيء زنا روك بكاري سجاد کے دی 
کفنی تمہارا کوئی نہیں دیکھو بائی میں زہرا کی جائی لاش پہ آئی ہوں بے پردا ہو کر مارا گیا ہے عباس گازی قاسم دلارا کوئی بے کس یتی موقع کافے لبائی تو ہی بتا دے کہاں لے کے جاؤں لاش سنبھالو یا کمبے کو دیکھو غم کا کنارا کوئی کریل جوا کی میت ہے آئی کہتی ہے لیلا اے میرے اکبر کس کی نظر تم کو کھا گئی ہے میرا سہارا کوئی نہیں لاش پہ زینب روکے پکاری بھیا ہمارا کوئی نہیں خیمے جلے اور سجاد کے دی کفنی تمہارا کوئی اب اللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سید شبیر کرمانی رسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز برادرز اور سسٹرز السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سرود فاتحہ is requested for a salah sabab of marhumin listed on the screen and for all marhumin al-fatiha بسم اللہ
I am Ayujib is requested for all those listening to the screen and for, for all those in need here and everywhere. Now let's recite together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amma yujibu al-Mutawwa idha da'a wa yakshifu su Amma yujibu al-Mutawwa idha da'a wa yakshifu su Amma yujibu al-Mutawwa idha da'a wa yakshifu su أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويخشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويخشف السوء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Adopted Park Cleanup Please join us as we visit our adopted park Leapy Moore Park for our next visit on Sunday June 5th this will be for our quarterly commitment to maintain and clean it in the name of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. We will be meeting there from 10 a.m. to noon. To register, please go to the website shown on the screen. At this time, I would like to invite Sheikh Sayyid uh, Shabir to give tonight's lecture with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في الصماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أظهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يغشى الله من عباده العلماء صدق الله العلي العظيم زينوا مجالسكم بالصلوات على محمد وآل محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, wherever you're hearing my voice, here in Florida or abroad, Salamun alaikum alaykum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Question, what is the future of scholarship in Islam? We're told there's a moment in time, the ruler by the name of Al-Walid, who was in Damascus at the time, he sends an order to his subordinate who is in Medina or Yathrib. And from Damascus on Sham, he sends the order to expand the mosque of Rasulullah, to expand the mosque of the Holy Prophet. At that point in time, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is the governor of Medina. This same Umar ibn Abdul Aziz will eventually become the Umayyad Khalifa, but at this time he's the governor of Medina. At that point in time, he begins to expand and begins this project. And when he begins this project, eventually Walid decides to pay a visit from Damascus towards Medina, to see personally that this is taking place. Now, of course, this was a political gesture to show people that I'm here and I'm actually concerned about the affairs of the citizens. Regardless, this is what happened. Eventually, when this project ensues, he notices in the city of Medina, this ruler, Walid, who has come from Damascus, the Umayyad ruler, that there is a dars, a class, a lesson, a lecture going on. And this lecture is being given on a topic that he's never heard of. He says, this is not Qur'an, this is not Hadith, as if he may have known that, but regardless. He's saying that, what is this subject? He began to ask his henchmen, he began to ask his wazirs, he began to ask his advisors, what subject are they talking about? This doesn't sound like an Islamic topic to my ears. 
They said, look, this is a science or this is the discussion concerning the earth and the heavens and the stars and the planets. Some example or some mixture in our words of physics and astronomy in our language. I said, really? He then noticed the ruler and glanced upon a young boy who was sitting in the crowd. A child, by our words, a child, roughly three years of age. He says, this boy is sitting in the gathering? He understands what being, is being said here? He says, he understands. The response came back, he perhaps understands better than you. He said, really? He said, let me ask him a few questions. He says, very well. They pull him to the side. The young man, can I ask you a few questions? He said, yes. So he may not have had his own questions, Walid. He said, maybe I can ask one of my wazirs and they'll give me a series of questions. He says, throw him an easy one first. He says, who is the founder of logic from that perspective of that society? He says, young man, tell me who is the founder of logic? Now, of course, there's a bigger argument to be had behind the scenes there, but in their perception of that time, who was the founder of logic as, as a fundamental science that was taught in a structured manner? The young boy responds, seemingly young boy, responds, Arastu, Aristotle. Shocked. He said, he's heard of Aristotle, he knows about Aristotle. Now, mind you, if you read the history of the world, you'll realize that there was, knowledge was such a powerful thing at the time, that the people who were the elite of society, only they had knowledge that was riddled, that was given to them. If you were from any other, upper, under the upper echelon of society, you didn't get access to knowledge. So he said, who's this young boy who I haven't heard of? He should either be from my family or he should not be around because he'll be a threat to my kingdom. He said, he knows about this? He says, wow. So give me another question. What should I ask him? He said, ask him who's Almaz. Now, mind you, this ruler doesn't know the answers himself. He's getting these from his wazirs to ask this young man. He says, who's Almaz? He looks back and he responds. He says, your question is incomplete. In fact, the name is incomplete. He said, but regardless... He says, this is actually in reference, this is the name of a constellation in the sky of stars. This is not an ordinary young man. And he continues and he begins to go down this question. He says, give me another one. He says, ask him, who is a Siwak? He says, young boy, tell me, who is a Siwak? He says, this is a reference to the name of the companion of the Holy Prophet. And one after the other, he begins to answer. He says, this is not an ordinary individual. He says, young man, please tell me, who is, what is your name? Who are you? Where are you from? Tell me, what's your name? He says, my name is Ja'far. He says, son of who? Son of Muhammad. From which family? From Banu Hashim. Who's this person giving the dars? Who's the one who's teaching? He says, my father, Muhammad al-Baqir. This was the knowledge that was exemplified of the sixth Imam at a young age of roughly three years, according to the narrations, at that time in the middle of Medina, which left the rulership spellbound. This is who you and I have come to commemorate tonight, none other than Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahu salamu alayhi, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In coming to discuss the life of the sixth Imam, Many, many important discussions and conversations emerge from the life of this blessed Imam. That is, we are spending our lives in the discussion of Rasulullah, in following in the footsteps, or trying to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah. We are trying to follow in the footsteps of Amir al muminin We are trying to follow in the footsteps of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. But when it comes to the end of the day, when you and I are known outside of these walls, amongst the broader Muslim community, we are not necessarily known as people who are Haidari. We are not necessarily known as people who are Husseini outside of these walls. When it comes to how are we identified outside of these walls, the first name that comes forward is that we are Ja'fari. That is the ones who adhere to the madhab of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and it is because of this very reason that it's very vital for us to study and understand and try to analyze the life of this Imam so that we understand where have we perhaps deviated in our modern society from what was the vision of the Imam and where are we today? And how can we correct our sail to get aligned with the vision of the Imam? At the first level, what I want to look at inshallah tonight is that is what lessons do we get from the life of the Imam straight away? 
away. That is, what is the intellectual studies that the Imam spent and gave and exerted his efforts on, number one. And number two, with respect to the situation in terms of how did the Imam deal with philosophers of the time? How did the Imam deal with political movements of the time? How did the Imam deal with the scientific movements of the time? And what do they teach you and I living in 2022 in Florida and the North America and beyond? At the next level, what I want to look at is with respect to our communities, what can we learn from the scholarship of Imam al-Sadiq and the future of scholarship in our communities. That is, if we want people to be around in North American Imam Bargas and Husseinias and Masajids, if we want them to be around in, the, in Europe, in Western Europe in particular, but beyond, if we want them, because the global village of the world that we live in now, if we want them to be anywhere, whether that's India or East Africa or Pakistan or Australia, if we want people to be around in the Masajids, what do we need to focus on in terms of the spiritual and intellectual development of the scholarship of our communities. And finally, what were the tragedies that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, saw? In particular, what did Imam al-Sadiq see? That first generation after Karbala, being that his father was in Karbala, him being the first generation after Karbala, how much did he remember Karbala? And what was his own personal tragedy with respect to his Shahada? This is our agenda for tonight. Wherever you are, here in Florida, across the globe, from the bottom of your heart, send a salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salam. At the first level, when we come to the life of the sixth Imam, if you look at this father, the fifth Imam, the fifth Imam is that individual who first laid that foundation of knowledge and scholarship in the city of Yathrib, which we call Medina. Now, mind you, Imam Amir al muminin Imam Ali, had already built on the first institution, which was the University of the Holy Prophet. And from that, he had established an institute of learning within Kufa, but it was not as large and as vast as it would become during the time of Imam Sadiq. Now stay with me. Eventually, as you know, there was the time of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and Imam Sajjad, where they could not outwardly propagate at a high scale. But when it came to the time of Imam al-Baqir, the fifth Imam, this is the time and the period that was able to bridge the heart and the mind of Shiaism. The heart being the movement of Karbala and the mind being the intellectual movement that the Imams had from before, but they were not able to make it manifest. Remember, there is one goal, and I remind you, and I've told you numerous times, there is one goal that all of the Imams had. The way that they achieved this goal was was different. But the common goal was Hafz al-Din wa Hafz al dima Preservation of the deen, preservation of the religion, and Hafz al dima Hafz meaning protection and preservation of dima dima meaning blood. Blood of who? Blood of the followers of the faith. This was the goal. They were trying to minimize bloodshed and they were trying to maximize the preservation of the faith throughout times. The way that the Imams did it was different. And we've talked about this in the past. Now coming to the era and time of Imam al-Baqir, did he have more knowledge than the other Imams? No, the knowledge of the Imams, remember this, according to the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, when it comes to certain things, all of the Imams are equal. What are these things? When it comes to the generosity of the Imam, when it comes to the courage of the Imam, the three ones that have been listed categorically are with respect to number one, their courage. Number two, with respect to their ibadah, their ibadah, their ubudiyah, all of them are the same. In fact, the narrations say, when someone came to Imam Sajjad and they said, how much will you worship? You are Sayyidul Sajideen. In fact, the narrations say that on the day of Qiyamah, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when Imam Sajjad, the fourth Imam comes, there will be a cry, Aina Zainul Abidin, and then the Imam will come. But what would the fourth Imam himself say when people would say to him, you are spending the whole day and the whole night in prayer and ibadah. To the point that narrations say that one time the Ahlul Bayt themselves, the other members of the family, they told Jabir, they said, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, you are a family member like, like family to us. You're so close. Tell Imam Sajjad to come home. He's been worshipping too much. And when he came, he responded, when they said, Yabna Rasulullah, how much will you worship? How much will you worship? He came forward and says, Where am I? And where is the ibadah of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
Imam Sajjad is looking. You and I would say there's no one worshipping more than him. But look, a principle that the Imam outlines here, you should always in spirituality, if someone comes to me and says, for example, or comes to you and says, you worship so much, you do so much ibadah, you do, you're always in the mosque, you're always doing this. He's looking upwards spiritually. Are we looking upwards? When I begin to say, for example, look at me, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and spiritually I'm this and I'm that. That's the decline. The Imam, Imam Sajjad is telling, I'm looking high. I'm looking at Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. So with respect to their courage, they're all the same. Imam Hussein's courage is founded in all of the Imams. But Imam Hussein was able to manifest it, for example. Imam Ali's courage is found in all the Imams, but he was able to manifest it. Number two, in terms of these elements that I've just outlined, these are the ibadah. They were all the same. But Imam Sajjad had to focus more on it. Why? Because in that time, he had to propagate Shiaism through the du'as of Sahih al Sajjadiya because you could not outwardly propagate. But when it comes to the knowledge, this is the third element, all of the Ahlul Bayt are equivalent and equal in knowledge. And when it comes to this element and this principle, Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq were those individuals who were able to manifest as well as Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. These three Imams, that is the fifth Imam, the sixth Imam, and the eighth Imam, who's known as Alim Ali Muhammad, were able to manifest the knowledge throughout to make it well known. But in knowledge, they were all the same. Kulluna Muhammad. Now, Imam Baqir is the one who lays the foundation once again and reestablishes the knowledge in Medina to make sure that people are aware of the Islamic sciences. They are aware of fiqh. They are aware of jurisprudence. They are aware of the Quran. They are aware of the deducing and how to deduce rules and laws and regulations. All of these things come forward during that time. And then the sixth Imam comes and builds upon the works of his father. Now, when it came to this, the Imam at the peak, they say, there were 4,000 students that were there in the university of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in Medina. But he had a satellite campus, you know, in our terms, he had a campus that was a regional campus that was in Kufa. In Kufa, there were about 900 students. All of them, according to historians, in each class, in each circle, in each halaqa that you would go to, all of those people in Kufa, which is in modern day Iraq, they were all saying, Qala Sadiq, Qala Sadiq, Qala Sadiq. That is Sadiq said, Imam Sadiq said. That is Imam Sadiq's in Medina, but his knowledge is beginning to perpetuate throughout. And they're all coming back and saying, this is the person who all roads of knowledge lead back to. But that is what's important to notice here, is it's not just in terms of his knowledge with respect to Islam, what we perceive as Islamic sciences. It was in the areas of science and technology, what we today call science and technology. In economics, in mathematics, in physics, in astronomy, as I, exam I gave the example a few moments ago. And all of those sciences in those fields. And one thing that we need to revive in our communities globally is this emphasis on holistic knowledge and understanding. Allow me to explain. If you read, for example, the history of Shia scholarship, you will find certain gems. For example, you will find the example of Khwaja Nasiruddin At-Tusi. Now, Khwaja Nasiruddin At-Tusi is that Shia scholar who was living in Baghdad during the time in which the Mongols came and invaded. Now, if you know the history of Mon the Mongols, Genghis Khan and the likes and these individuals, they were people who conquered a huge portion of the world. And at that time, this individual, Khwaja Nasiruddin Atusi, who's perhaps one of the top Shia scholars, he's a contemporary of Alama Hilli. If you remember our discussions on Alama Hilli, we said that Alama Hilli and Khwaja Nasiruddin Atusi, they had a catch and a pitch relationship in scholarship. Meaning what? When it came to Islamic principles, and for them, by the way, this is important to note, all of it was Islamic knowledge. They did not distinguish. You and I have come forward and distinguished and saying this is Islamic knowledge, this is non-Islamic knowledge. Please bear with me here. When it came to the understanding of Quran, of Hadith, of jurisprudence, of Fiqh, Khwaja Nasiruddin At-Tusi would take lessons from Allama Hilli and learn from him. But when it came to mathematics, when it came to astronomy, when it came to physics, this same Allama Hilli who was the teacher an hour ago, then becomes the student and learns under Khwaja Nasiruddin At-Tusi. Do I have that humility to be able to say that I don't know? Do I have that humility? 
Remember this. The verse of the Quran that I recited at the beginning. Innama, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Innama yaqsha Allah min ibadihi ulama. Innama, when Allah subhanahu wa taala in the Quran al-Majid wal Furqan al-Hamid, when He gives an innama clause, it's an exclusivity clause. Meaning what? Only these individuals and nobody else. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, another exclusivity clause in the Quran, Lan tarani, Lan, when that term is yun, Lan fisama laha, Lan tarani, when Allah says that, that means it's never gonna happen, never. Why? For example, Musa says, Ya Allah, I want to see you on the mount. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Musa, Lan tarani, will never happen, not gonna happen. He showed not a ray of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he showed a ray, a ray of light from one of his creations. It was not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Musa was not able to handle that. Similarly, when innama means only this category, no one else, what does Allah say? What is the definition of scholar in the, as per the Quran? It's the place where Allah has defined who is a scholar. A scholar in the terms of the Quran, innama yakshallaha min ibadihil ulama. The ones who are the ulama in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who have khashya, God consciousness, and those are those individuals who are humble. They're walking humbly on the earth. They're not arrogant individuals. There are levels to knowledge. What are the levels of knowledge according to the Ahlul Bayt? The first level of knowledge according to the first step of knowledge, if you imagine as knowledge as a staircase with three steps, the first level of knowledge is it leads to arrogance. Takabbur. When you get a little bit of knowledge, you start to thinking, I, I know this and I know that and I know this and I know that. The first level it leads to is arrogance according to the Ahlul Bayt. The second level of knowledge according to the Ahlul Bayt leads to humility, humbleness. You then begin to bow down that I don't know that much. How many things? Every time I learn something new, I realize how little I know. And the third level of knowledge according to the Ahlul Bayt is a state called Fana. Fana meaning you are, you are totally annihilated in understanding that I am nothing. And only what is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A question for you and I, where do we stand in that? Now coming back to Khwaja Nasiruddin Atusi. He was not only one of the top scholars in what we call Islamic sciences today. He was also that individual who was a scientist par excellence. Perhaps the biggest scientist of the time. In fact, he was responsible for the first absor observatory that was created in that region at the time. And he called on the Mongols to build this observatory. You go to LA, you go to other parts of the world, you go even in Florida, you go to DC, you'll find these telescopes that look towards the heavens. He at that time had built that. But remember, Khwaja Nasiruddin Tusi, his model, his focus on mathematics was so important. Why? Because Galileo's model of, and the Copernicus model of the universe does not stand without the Tusi couple in mathematics. That is, why were there scholars at that time who knew these things, number one? Now I'm, I'm connecting this with Imam Sadiq. Remember, Imam Sadiq, holistic education, number one. Number two, when you go further than this, Alama Tabatabai. Read the life and times of Alama Tabatabai. When you read the lives of uh, times of Alama Tabatabai, now remember, if I give you the examples of the time of Imam Sadiq, you'll say, hold on a second, that's a long time ago. Give me a modern example. Khwaja Nasir Dinu Tusi, a thousand, eight, nine hundred years ago. That's a while ago. Let me give you a modern example. Alama Tabatabai died in the 1980s, so not that long ago. And so he comes forward and he says in his own autobiography, when I wanted to learn and I came to Najaf, it wasn't that systemized at the time. He said, I wanted to get a teacher. And eventually I wasn't getting a teacher and I'm condensing in the interest of time. He said, I did a, I did a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Imam Ali alayhi salam in Najaf. And I said, Imam, help me. I've come to learn at your door. He says, the next day I got a knock on my door. It was Alama Qazi Tabatabai, who was a family relative, distant family relative. And he advised me and he said, find these teachers. One of the subjects that Alama Tabatabai says that he insisted on making sure that his student or his, his disciple, you can say, or the person he was mentoring or his mentee wanted, he wanted to make sure he studies is mathematics. He said, make sure amongst your teachers in Quran and fiqh and all these other subjects, make sure you get a mathematics teacher. He said, very well. So he said, he top, found the top mathematics teacher at the time. He said, I have one hour to give to you and that is in the, in the, right after Zuhar in Najaf. 
That time in the summer of Najaf, right after Zohar was a death sentence. It was like saying, nobody will accept that. But look, mujtahid, the root word of mujtahid is juhad, that is struggle. The same way as jihad, the struggle. He says, very well, I'll make the trip. He would make a two mile walk in the desert and every time he would get to class, mathematics class, by mind you, planar geometry class, he would say, I was sweating profusely to the point that I would wash myself off so that I did not smell in front of my teacher. And he did this and did this and did this and did this. Eventually, what was the benefit of this? Many years later, when he moved from Najaf, he moved back to Iran and he moved to Qom. Eventually, there was an expansion of a seminary that was going on. When the expansion of the seminary was going on, the lead scholar of the seminary said, we need to invite blueprints to come. And they need to pitch their model of how are we going to run this facility. So one after the other, the blueprints are coming from the civil engineers and the architect says, nope, 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 won't work, won't work, won't work. They said, these are the top engineers, the top architects from Tehran, from the biggest city in the town, and you're rejecting all of them. The principal says, look, these may be very good from a modern perspective, but they do not take into consideration the needs of our students here in the Hausa. The way they live, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they live their life, how they eat, how they pray. These things need to be taken into consideration. Every architecture has a philosophy behind it. So he rejected all of them up until the point that one day he said this, this is the blueprint, this will work. He said, this is the one we're going to go with. When he got this blueprint, they said, which engineer, which architect from Tehran, who sent this? He says, none of the known names. He said, none of these people sent it. In fact, the blueprint came from Qom itself. When this spread, the people began to say, hold on a second. This blueprint came from Qom itself? Is that possible? How? They said, they asked their principal, they asked their teacher, where did this blueprint come from? Please tell us. They said, some Sayyid has moved from Najaf, he's moved to Qom, he lives in this street, in this alleyway, go to this address and you'll find it. When they went and they went to that address, they knocked on the door, they found on the other side, Salamu alaykum wa alaykum as salam, who was it? The person who had begun to teach Ilm al akhlaq in that town, Alama Tabatabai himself. Those studies that they had done at that time were now paying dividends. Why? Third example, why this holistic nature is needed. Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr, Muhammad Baqar al-Sadr, that scholar who was killed by the Ba'athist party not too long ago while many of you were alive, this individual who many scholars in the house of Najaf today say, if he was alive, we would not declare our marja'iyah. We would not declare it. Because his knowledge caliber was that high. This individual, I'm giving you an example because many times people come to me and they say, is there only one view in the Hawza? I'm trying to explain to you the Hawza in Najaf and in Qom is a, it's like a university institution. And there are many views there that often do not trickle down to us that we don't know about, but they are discussed there in the walls of academia there that we often don't hear about. For example, one. This one that I'm sharing with you was held by Shaheed al-Sadr and his students themselves are on the record saying that he held this view. But all, by the way, I should say this, all the other scholars disagreed with him on this. But I'm telling you to show you there is a diversity of views within the scholarship. What is that? It's on the record that he had read, Shaheed al-Sadr, had read Marxism, he had read capitalism, he had read how the world economic system worked, and of course he had read how the Islamic system works. In fact, I remember speaking to one of the top scholars in the subcontinent region, or uh, having a, uh, this is on good authority, that he was planning to do a PhD and he had a teacher of his who was very, had a lot of animosity towards Shiaism. And he was a teacher. And he said that, what should I write my dissertation on? What should I write my research on? What should I do my research on? And eventually he would never give him any guidance. But he said, one day he cornered him and he said, what is one thing that you can tell me that I can research on this and it will be beneficial? He looked at his student and he said, look, you, why don't you study and do your research on Islamic economics? So what do you mean? He said, in particular, the works of Shahid al-Sadr, of Sayyid Muhammad Baqar al-Sadr. He said, as you know, I'm not a Shia, but you are from the Shia school of thought. He was a Shia, but regardless of that, if you remove Baqar al-Sadr from Islamic economics, Islamic economics collapses in the modern era. 
He said, wow, if someone who had animosity is saying this, you know that there's credibility. Why? Coming back. He had studied the system of economics in both in the East and West, and he knew the Islamic system. And he knew the ethos of it, the essence of it. Why am I saying this? Because he understood how the world works. He understood. You go to any of our youth here or anyone who goes to college, they study their first class in business, for example, they are taught time value of money. They are taught, of, for example, opportunity cost. They are taught these principles. For example, if you give me $100 today and I give you $100 in a year, have I given you back the same $100? They'll say no. Opportunity cost, time value of money, no way. You've given me maybe with inflation nowadays, maybe I've given you half of that. I don't know. It's pretty bad. So what... They understand this principle. Based on studying this, Shahid al-Sadr's view was a flat rate. He said the word that is haram in Islam is riba. That is in the Old Testament, in the Bible, as well as the concept in the Quran is usury, usury, not interest. His view, I'm sharing with you. He says, so according to him, a flat rate of interest, which makes the person whole again, is acceptable. That is, if it's something, and by the way, there are ways, if you study Islamic economics, you'll understand what he was getting at. But again, all they all said, no, 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 we disagree, we don't accept this. Why do I say this? If we're looking at the future and building on the manhaj and the view and the thought of Imam al-Sadiq who are here to commemorate tonight. I can repeat the same stories of Imam al-Sadiq that you have heard for 30, 40, 50 years that you know better than I do about the egg and the Imam explaining to the atheist. By the way, when the atheist comes to the Imam and the Imam comes forward to him, he says, explain God to me, explain the proven evidence of God to me. He comes forward and he says, what if I told you there was a fortress and inside this fortress there was a thin layer and inside this thin layer there was molten silver and molten gold. Yet the molten gold, that is the liquid gold and the liquid silver were not mixing. Will you believe it to me? Will you believe me saying this? The atheist says, no, how can it be? A young boy was passing by, Imam al-Sadiq takes, he says, can I see what's in your hand? He gives it to him. The Imam takes it, it's an egg. He says, look at this. There is a fortress, there is a layer within, there is molten liquid, there is molten gold, there is not anything that is mixing between the two. In fact, if you open it, they will not, they will still be separated. But what if I told you that afterwards, out of this fortress will come a bird or a, a creature, and then there will be skin, and then there will be bones, and then there will be a beak, and then there will be eyes, and there will be this, and there will be that. And nothing went in to design it, and nothing came out of it except that. What do you believe? He was spellbound. But remember, the Imams always talk to people on their level of intellect. The paradigm of science and technology in the world has moved forward. What is it today? Anthony flew, my young ones and old ones alike. Remember this, and I need to say this point here. When we say youth in our communities, and this is a big issue that we face globally, when we say youth, automatically in people's minds, the concept of children comes in. Teenagers, people who are 9, 10, 11, 16, 17, under 18. But you need to understand, and I need to understand, there is a huge demographic in our communities who are in their 20s, who are in their 30s, who are in their 40s, who we are losing. If you have a bucket of our community, there are holes in the bucket and the water is seeping through. We're losing them by the dozen. Because we don't have a term to catch and address their needs. The deeper understanding of the science, of the Qur'an, of Islam, and the world and where the world is. Why do I say that? Because my goal and my manifesto is clear to you. The elders here, I learn from them. But in terms of the intellect of where we've gone, where are we addressing the needs that are needed for our next generation? And that will not happen until there is integrity in the seat of scholarship in our communities, nationally and globally. I mentioned to you Thursday night some things that are important. And I said that, for example, one dimension of raising the scholarship is making sure the best minds come there. But if the best minds come there, make sure they are economically viable. That's one part of the, that's one dimension of the equation. That's one variable in the equation. That's not sufficient. There's another dimension that you need, because if you just pay people, then you can pocket scholars in your pocket. If I'm wealthy, I can own them, and I can have them say what I want them to say, as that has been happening throughout time and memorial. Then you need something called tenure, that's, the, that's what emerged in the university system. 
When that emerged in the university system, the church which established the first universities in the West, they said, we want you to do research. But Copernicus and Galileo and the likes said, hold on a second, you want me to do research, but you say that the center of the world is the earth, the geocentric model. But our research says the center of the universe is the sun. If I say that, you will kill me tomorrow. Why would I do this research? It's a conflict of interest. Why would I do it? So then they said, okay, okay, don't worry. We'll implement the tenure system. That is, if you reach tenure in university, then no matter what you say or do, we cannot fire you. We cannot remove you for the position. So there's no system of tenure. In fact, in our communities, it's the opposite. It's pure conformity. You have to get with the program or get out. But that doesn't sit well with the mind of a thinker who's in their 40s or 50s or even or less than that in our modern world. Remember, I gave you the example. Rocket scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. You can't be a rocket scientist in the morning and shut off your brain at night. Doesn't work like that. So what's the proof and evidence that you give a young mind to address that? There needs to be integrity in this chair, in this position. You know when you go to Harvard and MIT and all the universities across the globe, there's a chair of mathematics, a chair of physics. You know this comes from Islam? The Kursi, when the first universities were established in the Muslim world, for example, the Qarawiyun in Fez in Morocco, they used to have one chair, for example, or even in the institution of Medina, there was one chair where the teacher would sit and the rest would sit on the floor. That's where the chair term comes from till this day. If there is not respect, that is, if I don't respect that the person who is sitting on the member, wherever the member is, that that person is just as smart as me, if not smarter, that person's position has weight in it. I'll give you an example. In the Jewish community, I give you the economic example, but there's another example. If there is a disagreement between, and I have friends who are Jewish, and I've confirmed this with members of the Jewish community, if there is, I'm talking about the practicing community, if there is a dispute in the community, and two parties, they make the mediator, the rabbi, whatever the rabbi say is the final word and everyone accepts, even if they don't like it. That means there is respect in that seat. Until and unless there is respect in that seat, there, the graph of our communities is not going to be solid. Because I know, and you know, the issues that are entailed there. Antony Flew, my young ones, is Islam and science at contradiction. Antony Flew, never ever forget this name. He was the biggest atheist of the 20th century. When it came to the 21st century, towards the end of his life, towards his death, he came forward and said, I change my view. I believe in God. They said, Anthony Flew, you are the reason that we rejected God and now you believe in God? How is it possible? He said three letters. He said, deoxyribonucleic acid. Said, what? DNA. He said, DNA. He says, DNA, Anthony Flew says, DNA does not allow me to reject the existence of God. He says, why? He says, do you know how much information is encoded in DNA? The adenine, guanine, cytosine, these things that make up the DNA of the human being. That DNA is what gives you, for example, your hair and your height and your behavior and all the aspects that make you, you. I will save you the mathematics. You know, one of the challenges that you face is in this time, we get people at the toughest time of the day. Some youth, and I credit due to them, we have chai afterwards. Perhaps we should have chai before the program so that people are more alert and be able to digest these things. But regardless, he says the amount of data and information that is in DNA, we don't have that amount of data in our world today. It will come in 2026, 2025, 2026, where even with the flood of data science and machine learning and all of these things. He says that information has been encoded and programmed. Know this, wherever you see a program, something that has been programmed, know that there is a programmer. Someone programmed this. That is God. The answers are there, my dear brothers and sisters. The question is, have we actually gotten to that point? If we want the future of our community's scholarship to be there, that is strong, that is robust, we need to make sure that we put respect in the chair of where the person is sitting. Otherwise, what's going to happen is exactly what happened in the subcontinent. The subcontinent, there was two words that were used. One was Pesh Imam. Pesh Imam, which if you don't know, the back, what ended up happening was Pesh Imam was simply that person who just leads namaz and that's it. They, 
the people had no respect for that person in terms of their intellectual capacity. Then there were others who were the scholars who were going around the world and lecturing. I say this because there's some heavy things. Look, if COVID's taught us anything, it's that we don't know how long we have. I'm here to tell you that the resident alim model across the world is dying. In fact, in North America, it's not dying. I don't want to be as Nietzschean or say it the way Nietzsche said, but it's dead. Why? The people who are well known and reciting are across the globe, they don't want to settle down. Because they know the psychology of the matter is there's a honeymoon period and then it declines and then you get used to it and you get bored and you say move on. So they don't want to settle down. And the people who do want to settle down, the people don't want them to settle down. So what do you do? I'm telling you to try to raise awareness because we need a strategy at a national level to try to address this problem because if the people who are supposed to be telling us about Islam are either coming with a, a version of Islam that is a version of Islam that is heavily influenced by one worldview or there may not be those people who are understanding of a comprehensive understanding the young person will not have credibility and say that that person knows about what's going on in the world and that's why it's high time that we have comprehensive education. My young ones, those people who go to, I encourage you, go to Ivy League, go to the Harvards, go to the MITs, go to the Columbia's, with Iman, with belief. And in that di dynamic, also understand Abba Sam, the same way Imam Sadiq, the same way the Ahlul Bayt. There's much to say on this, but we need, the goal is get all the minds together to say, how do we tackle this problem? And many others like it. There's much to say, we'll leave it here, inshallah. This Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam gave everything. And the same individual, when his knowledge and his influence increased, the same thing happened with him that happened with the other Imams. The ruler said, We need to eliminate him. So they sent the poison towards the Imam to make sure that he was poisoned and he was finished off with. And there was no influence of his knowledge that was impacting the world. The world, the same Imam we are told in narrations, there's a moment in time where his house, while he's alive, his house is beginning to burn. When his house is beginning to burn, at that point in time, the Imam is seeing the fire, he is seeing the burning, and he is seeing it in front of his eyes. And when he's seeing his burning in front of the eyes, at that point in time, the people are beginning to leave the house. When they begin to leave the house, they see the Imam is crying. At that point in time, the companions, they came to Imam as Sadiq. They said, Yabna Rasulillah, everyone's come out of the house. There is nothing to worry about everyone's okay why are you crying this house you are not people of this dunya you are not materialistic people why are you crying about this house he says i am not crying about this house imam as sadiq alayhi salam says he says that why then why are you crying the imam looks back and says i am crying because i notice that the men the women and the children they were moving from room to room on their way out of this house i remembered a scene he says what was that scene he says i remembered the seen on the day of Ashura when they began to light the tents on fire of Hussein ibn Ali, my grandfather Abba Abdullah, the women and children were running from one tent until the other and so that moment was coming into my eyes, I was thinking about my aunt Zainab I was thinking about my family I was thinking about what they went through, azadaro do jumle salam ho على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا أمير المؤمنين صلى الله عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة النساء العالمين صلى الله عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين معتم يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين
يا حسين يا حسين اغفر لي خطاي وذنوبي يا الله والتف بي واستر لعيوبي يا الله وتقبل ممن يشفع لي بحق جافر صادق جافر صادق جافر صادق جافر صادق جافر بابا تمہارے باقر مادر ہے ام فریبا رحمت میں سب سے کسرت سرکار میں ہوں آلہ تم شام کی سیاہی کو پیرہن بنا کر ہر رات مفلسوں کو ہاتھوں سے ہے کھلایا جعفر صادق جعفر صادق تمہاری اور نبی کی ایک روز ہے ولادت اور راہ عدل حق میں تھی آپ کی شہادت احمد کی روح تیری روح سے جری ہوئی ہے سارے ملک پہ واجب ہے آپ کی اطاعت جعفر صادق جعفر صادق جعفر صادق گودی ہے جن کی کھالی اولاد انہیں عطا کر مقروض مومنوں کو جو کرز ہو ادا کر ہے بے خطا جو قیدی دے دے انہیں بشارت کرتے ہیں ہم توصل ہاتھوں کو اب اٹھا کر جعفر سادے جعفر سادے جعفر سادے بے چینی یہ جگر ہے ہم تم سے جو جدا ہے یس رب کو تم بلا لو لب پہ یہی دعا ہے آکے کرے زیارت اور عشق ہم بہائے تیرے لیے مولا یہ دل تڑپ رہا ہے جعفر سادے جعفر سادے جعفر سادے جعفر سادے رحم اللہ من قرآن الفاتحہ السلام عليك يا رسول الله يا نبي الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين يا علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا حسين شهيد بكربلاء السلام عليكم جميعا شحداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته 
السلام عليك يا علي بن الحسين زين العابدين السلام عليك يا محمد بن علي الباقر السلام عليك يا جعفر بن محمد الصادق السلام عليك يا موسى بن جعفر الكاذم السلام عليك يا علي بن موسى الرضا السلام عليك يا محمد بن علي التقي السلام عليك يا علي بن محمد النقي السلام عليك يا حسن بن علي العسكري السلام عليك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان سيدي الأمان 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 من فتنة الزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها تويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين